At the Spring 2016 Adaptive Learning Open House at Oregon State University, educators were given a chance to see demos and ask questions from 11 different ed tech vendors supporting adaptive and personalized learning. In the first episode, we asked these faculty, support staff, and administrators why they held this workshop and how they defined the product category. In this episode, we asked, does this technology apply at a research institution, and if so, in what context? What are the potential benefits, and what are the potential risks of using this technology? And what advice would they give to these vendors? There seems to be a huge variety among these different providers in terms of what they are promising to provide or what their tool may provide. I would love to pick and choose some various elements from the different providers and to create our own platform, if you will. The main reason for using it is, is to achieve kind of a consistent kind of space testing where you can have the students to sort of constantly be testing their their knowledge about the material. That's hard to do in class because you waste a lot of time handing out tests and yeah. the instructor has to grade them. So it's nice to be able to uh, have a more you know mechanical version of that online. But I do see some potential for for this type of tool or support. For example, I could see this being used in a flipped classroom where a lot of front loading of vocabulary of content, uh, basic prerequisite knowledge could be provided prior to class time and then students going into the classroom and working with an instructor at that time to apply what they've learned, synthesize that knowledge, uh, you know, to work with the content. Really, it's in those skill building courses where there's a lot of repetition, a lot of uh, habit formation on the part of the student that adaptive tools seem to really help the student accelerate their learning even as it's personalized for them. So what we have identified here at OSU is a set of about 28 courses that for us represent not only a high attrition rate, meaning students are getting Ds, Fs, or withdrawing from them, but they're also predictable of future student success. And so by identifying those 28 courses, we now have a base where we're finding students uh, experiencing the highest level of challenge. Uh, and so we're hoping to identify some of those courses that do have that kind of skill-based approach so that a, um, a faculty member can use a tool that fits what it is that they're trying to do that maybe will help them with sort of the rote learning so that the faculty member can actually spend more time in doing some more of the deep learning that yeah. they would like to do. Well, personally, I've had a difficult time the last two days because there seems to be a huge emphasis on students on, at risk, right? High dropout rate students, um, students who are failing, who are struggling. I am a big believer in differentiated instruction, and oftentimes that's where teachers, their gut goes to. You know, you're a struggling student, so therefore I want to support you. But what about those students who are working at course level or even beyond the course content, who oftentimes don't come to class because they've already mastered that content, they're bored. What we have to always, I think, watch for is whether or not this becomes, you know, a more of a technology approach or whether it's, you know, one of those throw technology at it and we'll fix it. We have to be so intentional and, and systematic in it that, and watch for that all the way through. And I think that's, that's probably unique um, because it's easy to throw technology at things and, you know, between the CIO and, and me and others who are involved in this, we maybe have a little bit of a technology bent to it, but in fact, we have to constantly bring that back and say, really, what is the outcome? And learner success is goal one. I think, I think it will vary by discipline and level and services that help them enhance their course. Sure. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of courses that we offer that are distinctive. There are, as you noted, some things that we would probably have to pay attention to. Unintended consequences, certainly high, high in that. That's why we're kind of taking an intentional and iterative process to it. One of the interesting things that's come up in our conversations over the last six to 12 months about this is talking to other institutions that went out and just bought something like that and found out, wow, this doesn't work for us. And so we're trying to avoid that risk, that problem, by you know, being very intentional 
very open by bringing the faculty in at a, a, in an environment where they have the opportunity to see and play and try and uh, and really uh, you know using that as our as our risk averse kind of environment uh, kind of approach to it. Some of these tools seem very complex. Um, you know, I, I believe in you, you get out of it what you put into it, right? I, I believe in that concept. Um, but I'm hearing a big variety. Some are saying this is a 10 minute tool. It takes 10 minutes to add this thread into your course. And others are saying four to six months to design a course. Successful implementation of these kinds of resources require cultural readiness. In order to bring any tool into an environment with such a long history of doing things a certain way. When the tool requires that you think differently about what you're doing, in this case, teaching and learning, and how that's occurring, there has to be, first of all, a readiness by the community to want to even consider an alternative way of doing something. Yeah, the biggest problem, honestly, is companies that overpromise and, and make all sorts of claims of efficacy for which they have absolutely no evidence. Or they have evidence, but because they don't really, haven't really designed the study right, it can't tell them what they're claiming it, it tells them. It's a real problem out there. So I think that one of the challenges is a natural fear uh, on behalf of uh, faculty and the people that have been very comfortable doing what they're doing to feel like, wow, you know, this is different from the way I was trained in graduate school. I can tell you personally, it's different from the way I was trained in graduate school. We didn't use these tools. First of all, there's nothing really new about this. We've been, you know, there have been adaptive learning stuff around for a hundred years. And we've been studying it intensely since at least the, the 50s. And it's, there's been, you know, waves of this that come along every, you know, 10, 20 years. It, it's not going to solve all your problems. I mean, frankly, if this is all we're doing, we're screwing up. But there's a role for it. This really seems to have a behaviorist approach to teaching and learning. This feels very limiting to me. Some providers seem to do a better job in providing various types of resources from videos to you know, discussion boards to literature to audio blogs, various types of input, but really it is more of a comprehension a type of assessment. In what ways could you comprehend what you heard, what you read? I'd like to see more opportunities for constructivist approaches to, to teaching and learning. I think I've seen a couple of models. Um, some faculty very much, you know, know what they want to do and want to do it themselves. We tend to, uh, where possible, try to do the first build of, co of the course ourselves and uh, strive to kind of, without doing quality matters properly, meet as yeah. many quality matters type yeah. of standards uh, because we think it's a good way to reflect um, what's going on with the design. Personally, the biggest risk of barrier might it be that it's oversold. I like to think of them as providers of not just tools, but services. And more than that, I want to think of them as partners. And I think that that's the biggest message that I can send. I would like for them just to start listening to what the other providers are providing and to think about how they might expand their tools to encompass some of these other ideas. Because like I said, each, each provider seems to have its own uh, twist or flavor or emphasis, but there's a lot of really great ideas that I think could make a more comprehensive tool or package. And so we're really looking for a partnership. We're not looking for someone who's going to come in with a shiny tool and say, here you go. Here's the business transaction. Good luck with it. We're looking for someone who's really going to partner with us on faculty training, on how does this interact with the systems that we have in place? How do we integrate this with the technology? How do we uh, pull the data that we're going to need to make sure that it's usable? Yeah.